Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for Midweek Bible Study. And as you can see, we are in the mountains. We are just outside of Blue Ridge, Georgia. And uh, we are sitting out on the front porch. Uh, you can see the mountains behind me, the Smoky Mountains, and how beautiful they are with the, the clouds and the mountains behind me. Just an absolutely gorgeous scenery. And we just wanted to share that with you all this evening as we do this Bible study. And uh, again, how in the world can anyone look at this beauty and not believe in a Creator? I don't understand that at all. Welcome once again, Mark chapter 12. We'll begin in verse 18 in just a minute. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful for this day. Thank you so much again for allowing us to gather together. Even though we're not in person, Lord, we're gathered together to study your word. I ask that you would bless this time. Help us, Father. Open your word up to us. Help us to receive that that we need to receive. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, and we'll just look at verses 18 through 27 to start with. As we pick up from last week when we studied verses 1 through 17, we saw the parable of the vineyard owner where Jesus uh, pointed out to the Pharisees and the leaders that he knew exactly what they were planning on doing. They weren't uh, hiding anything. They weren't getting away with anything. He knew everything that was going on. There was then a question about taxes, uh, those that had to be paid to Caesar, and of course we talked about those. This week as we pick up, uh, they continue to ask questions. Uh, this first uh, question is trying to trap Jesus once again. Uh, the second question is actually from someone that uh, seems to really care. Uh, unlike some of the other leaders. And then Jesus begins to question and condemn the leaders. So we'll look at those four things this evening. Let's begin with verses 18 through 27. It says, Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they ask him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. The second took her and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven." And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spoke unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. And so we have these Sadducees. They come up and begin to speak to Jesus and ask him this question. And it says that the Sadducees believe in no resurrection. Well, there are other things that they didn't believe in as well. Uh, they did not believe in any afterlife whatsoever. They believed that this life here on earth was it. Once you died, you died. Your soul died. Everything died. There was no heaven. Uh, there's no hell. There's also no angels. There are no demons. Um, and um, they also basically just believed in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They didn't believe in any of the oral tradition or uh, of any of the other books. And so everything uh, that they believed was primarily from those books. And so they missed a lot. It's just like people today in churches that say all you need is the New Testament. Well, you miss so much if you don't study the Old Testament. In order to truly, just like here with this passage of Scripture, in order to truly understand the New Testament, we have to know the Old Testament. The Old Testament uh, helps us to understand why Jesus has done what He's done and is going to do by dying on the cross, rising again. Uh, you know, it also explains 
explains to us uh, why things happen the way they happen in the New Testament. And so the entire Bible is important. Again, the Bible tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, that he may be thoroughly equipped. So we are equipped by studying the Word of God. And so these Sadducees with these beliefs come to Jesus and they know that Jesus, again, um, tends to side more with the Pharisees who did believe in all of those things. And so they ask him a question. Well, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and rise up his seed unto his brother. And so this is actually, Moses wrote this in Deuteronomy 25, beginning in verse 5. And let me read that passage of Scripture to you. In Deuteronomy 25, beginning in verse 5, it says, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother should go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel." And so I'll just read those two verses. There are others that talk about what happens if the brother refuses to uh, obey the commandment here. Um, we have an example of this uh, in the book of Genesis, um, chapter 38, I believe it is, uh, with Tamar. If you remember... Um, uh, is it Judah and Tamar? It, uh, and I meant to look this up. I apologize before we got started here. Uh, let me go to... Um, um yes, in uh, chapter 38, uh, Judah and Tamar. Remember, Tamar was his daughter-in-law. And uh, her... Um, husband was wicked and God killed him and so the brother was told to go in but he went in and he did not perform the right he spilled his seed on the ground and uh, he died also and so uh, Judah just basically said hey uh, when my other son grows up I'll give you to him however he grew up and Judah did not do so so Tamar uh, dressed herself up as a prostitute and Judah saw her by the side of the road went into her slept with her uh, left his signet ring and his staff, his identification, and was supposed to uh, have a servant bring an animal back as payment, but when the servant got back, she was gone. She got pregnant and uh, ended up confronting him because he did not do what the law said should be done. And uh, this law is what is known as the Leverett Law, uh, L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E, I believe it is, the Leverett Law. Um, and um, again, if a man died and left his wife and they had no children, especially male children, the next brother was to go in <coughs> and was to sleep with her so that she could have a male child. And what would happen? That was in order for her to be able to maintain the family's property. Because the Old Testament gave commands that people were supposed to keep their property and not sell it, not give it away. But it was supposed to remain in the family and in the clan. And so for her piece of property, in order for her to be able to maintain that, she needed a male heir. And so that's why this law was set in place to help take care of, of the woman. And, and uh, uh, so this was put in place for that specific reason. And so they go on with this and... Um, it sounds ridiculous, but again, it, it happened with at least two brothers in Genesis 38. But they said, okay, there's seven brothers. They took a wife, and none of them got her pregnant. They all died, and then finally she died. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Now remember, they don't believe in the resurrection. They're just trying to throw Jesus a curveball here. And um, since all seven had her as wife, whose wife will she be? And of course, Jesus responded unto them. And first thing he says, you're wrong. Uh, do you not therefore err? Because you know not the Scriptures. And so Jesus is telling them, uh, if you knew the Scripture, if you really knew God and His power, you would understand how ridiculous this question is. 
He says, when they shall rise from the dead. Now notice he doesn't say if they rise from the dead. He says when they rise from the dead. So Jesus here is telling us we will rise from the dead. If there's one listening that doesn't believe that to be the case, then you're calling Jesus a liar. Because Jesus says when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Right. Now what is he saying here? Well, we have to understand here on earth, uh, men get sick, they get old, and they die. And so we pro procreate in order to keep the earth populated. Remember with, uh, with um, Adam and Eve, they were told to go out and what? Uh, fill the earth with children to procreate. Of course, this began to occur uh, after they had sinned and were cast out of the garden. And so <clears throat> they procreate. They uh, uh, have children and their children grow up and have children and their children grow up and on and on it goes up to us today. But angels do not have children. Uh, angels are created beings. There were a specific number of angels created by God. What is that number? We have no idea what that number is. Uh, a multitude, I, I assume, a great multitude, but again, God created a set number. They do not reproduce. They do not procreate. Now, we can get into Genesis 6 and talk about that, but that is an entirely different situation. Uh, some people try to tie it in with this, and maybe that is something we can take up later, but uh, uh, not right now. And so, anyway, he says they don't marry. They're not given in marriage, but uh, we'll be like the angels in heaven. And so when my wife and I uh, die and we go to heaven, will we know each other? Yes, we will. Uh, but we will be brothers and sisters in Christ. We will no longer be uh, married, if you will, as far as I know. Now, we don't know completely how all that's going to work out, but I don't imagine that, that uh, you know, if, if a man had a Christian wife and she died and he married another Christian woman and he died or she died, or, and eventually he died, then you know you would seem to have a situation there. Um, and so will we remember that we're married? Well, I imagine that would probably be the case. Uh, but again, uh, we will not continue, I don't believe, that marriage situation in heaven, but we will be brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're going to be too busy worshiping Christ anyway for all that stuff and doing whatever else it is that He wants us to do. And so he explains all that. And then he says it's touching the dead that they rise. And again, they don't believe that the dead rise. He says, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him? And so uh, he says, listen, let's talk about the dead for just a minute because you also are wrong about this. When God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, and I know you believe that scripture, what did God say? I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. He didn't say I was the God of Abraham, but he's gone now. I was the God of Isaac, but he's gone now. I was the God of Jacob, but he has died. But he says, no, I am. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. And what does Jesus say here? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. And so we see here that though these men are dead in body, they are very much alive. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, if they were not alive, then how is it at the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah were able to come down and speak with Jesus? I mean, if they were dead, did God just suddenly raise them up from the dead and send them down to talk to Jesus about what? Because they have been dead and asleep. So what are they going to be talking to Jesus about? But no, they were alive in spirit. We believe that one day they'll be reunited with their bodies just as we'll be reunited with ours if we die before the rapture occurs. But they are alive. And so God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. 
And so right here, he refutes their doctrine. He refutes uh, the fact that um, of the resurrection that uh, they believe there won't be one. He says, yes, there will be one. Uh, yes, there is a heaven. Yes, there are angels. So he goes and refutes all their doctrine in just these couple of short verses right here. And again, reminds them what? Several times, you do err. You are in error in your beliefs. And so, another group has come. They thought they were going to trap Jesus. And yet Jesus has the answers. Why? Because He is God manifest in the flesh. He is the Messiah. He knows all. He knows what they were coming to do to start with. And so He knows all of these things. All right, well, here we have right after this, here comes somebody else with another question. Though this gentleman seems to be sincere here, he has a, a more of a legitimate question, I believe, and uh, Jesus even acknowledges that uh, legitimate question. And so let's look at verses um, 28 through uh, 34. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked them, or asked him, rather, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Again, Deuteronomy 6, 5. And the second is like, namely, this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And this is mentioned in Leviticus 19, 18, as well as a couple of times in the New Testament. Verse 32, and the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. And so we see a scribe come. Now, these scribes, maybe they've been here watching all of this, uh, hearing the parable of the vineyard owner, the question of the taxes, the question of authority in Mark chapter 11. I uh, just heard the Sadducees with this. Maybe he was there, maybe he wasn't. But um, it says he's heard them reasoning together. And perceived he had answered them well. And so this scribe is recognizing. He's saying, you know what? Jesus so far, and so that tells us that he was there, or at least somebody's told him, has answered all these questions very well. This man has some knowledge. I need to speak to him to enhance my knowledge, to learn from him. You know, a lot of these Pharisees, and all we talked about it Sunday, this Pharisee called Jesus Master in the modern translations, Teacher. Um, but what were they doing? They were um, just um, being polite, if you will. Uh, they didn't really respect him so much as that. Uh, but here we have a scribe that seems like he really respects Jesus and says, this man has, has some understanding that I need to find out more about. And so he goes and he asks him, he says, which is the first commandment of all? In other words, Lord, what is the most important commandment? Now, the scribes, the Pharisees, and Sadducees, all these groups, especially the scribes and the Pharisees, what are they caught up in? Obeying the law, keeping the law, the sacrifices at the temple, worship at the temple. You know, that is the focus. The focus is not on God, but it is on all of these acts that we're doing. And we have to be cautious with that even today because sometimes we can get so caught up in certain churches that have lively worship with worship that we're worshiping worship instead of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Or we're worshiping the preaching of the Word instead of worshiping the one that the preaching should be about. 
which is Jesus. And so the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, they are so caught up in obeying the law and, and in the temple sacrifices and the worship that they are doing those and not thinking about who it is they are truly worshiping. That should be the focus. And so he says, okay, what is the greatest commandment of all? And so Jesus quotes him a passage of Scripture that he'll be very familiar with, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And so there is one true God. Uh, all the other gods, little g gods, are false gods. There's one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. And he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, Deuteronomy 6, 5, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And otherwise, what is he saying? We are to love God with all of our being. God should be our first love above everything else. That includes family, that includes wives, children, parents, grandparents. Uh, God should be the number one love of our life. That is the first commandment. But then he goes on and gives him a second commandment. He says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, we've talked a little bit about this before, but I want to show you tonight. And uh, again, these two commandments actually uh, encompass all ten commandments. We look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And we can read the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to give them to you in the short version here in just a minute. And we can really break these down to these two commandments. And so let's look real quick. Uh, commandment number one, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number two, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Number three, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God, thy God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So the first four commandments are of the Ten Commandments do what? They honor God. The first four honor God. And if we obey those first four, then we should love the Lord with what? All our heart, soul, mind, body, strength. We should love Him with every ounce of our being. And so that's the... Verse 4, well, the last six cover the second command about loving our neighbor. Uh, so, uh, number five, honor thy father and mother. Number six, thou shalt not murder. Seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Eight, thou shalt not steal. Nine, thou, sh thou shalt not bear false witness. And ten, thou shalt not covet. So, what has happened here? These last six commandments, uh, if we obey those, if we love our neighbor, then we should be able to obey the, uh, these things. We should not murder. We should not steal from someone. Uh, we should honor our parents. Uh, we should not covet what our neighbors have. We should not bear false witness against our neighbors. We shouldn't steal from them. Right. If we do those things, then are we really loving our neighbor? Mm -hmm. And then we can go back to Jesus with a good Samaritan and say, as the Pharisee did, well, who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus showed us a random guy coming up to a Samaritan right. and taking care of him. Or a, um, a random Samaritan coming up to a guy that's injured and taking care of him. Right. So that means people are our neighbor. Right. Which means we should treat people by not lying about them, by not stealing from them, by not yeah. killing them by not coveting what they have. These are things that we should be doing, and especially Christians today should be doing these things. And so we see here, Jesus takes these Ten Commandments, and really the other commands, and He narrows them down to these two. You love God, and you love your neighbor. If you do that, you got it covered. That's right. You got it covered. And so what does the scribe say? Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and none other but He. 
And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So again, he recognizes that these things are more important than those other things, those physical things they are doing, offering sacrifices in the temple, uh, burnt offerings in the temple. No, we should love God and we should love our neighbor. So he says, man, that's it. And Jesus saw that he answered well, and he says, you know what? You're not far from the kingdom of God. What does it come down to? Well, now he needs to recognize who the Messiah is. Does he recognize him or not? I guess we'll find out one day. But again, there were others standing around, and after they heard this, it says no one dared ask him any more questions right now so they've hit him with a bunch of questions and he's answered everyone they thought they had him every time but he answered well and i imagine he's looking at all them when he's uh, the the scribe says hey god neighbor is more important than all these sacrifices we're doing hmm so they don't ask him anything else so now it's jesus turn to ask some questions So what does Jesus say? It says, Jesus answered and said, While he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And so we ask him a question. The scripture says that David, and he is quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, to show that David, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, understood the Messiah to be his Lord. And so David, remember what did God tell David? You will always have a man sit on a throne from your line, always, until there's one that's going to come. And David calls him Lord. Now the king is calling someone else Lord, so he recognizes this is more than just some blood kin of mine. What is he revealing to us? Well, yes, he is in the line of David and the, uh, the genealogies in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke uh, point those things out to us that he is indeed in the line of David. But also he is Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So David also recognizes that he is more than just a man. This, uh, again, David doesn't understand everything. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit to say these words. But we know now that, again, the Messiah is none other than God manifest in the flesh. The Bible tells us that. And so he asks them this question because they're looking at lineage and he's saying, well, why is David calling him Lord? He's the king. And he says, the Lord said to my Lord. Now, see, that's interesting, too. And this gets in some deep theological stuff that, again, we do not have time to bear out here. But the Lord, that is God, said to my Lord. That's not another God because there's only one. So, hmm, isn't that interesting? Sit at my right hand till I make thine enemy thy footstool. We've talked about sitting at the right hand. What is the right hand? Seated at the right hand is the place of honor. But what else? It is also the place of authority. In other words, if the king says, you come and sit at my right hand, if something happens to the king or if he has to leave on business or do something, guess who's going to be in charge? The man seated at his right hand. The one at his right hand is the one that he trusts, the one that says, you know what? He can handle business while I'm out of town. I can trust him completely. I don't have to worry about it. Right. Is that not our Lord Jesus Christ who is seated at the right hand of God? Amen. Now again, this is the man, Christ Jesus. Now you say, wait a minute, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. How does all that work out? You know what? 
that's one of those mysteries I don't understand. Nobody truly understands, but uh, I think we'll uh, have a little bit of understanding of that one day. And again, once we see Jesus and all His glory, I don't know that we'll be too concerned about that anyway. Right. So we'll understand to a degree. And so He asks this question to him very simply. How does His Son, how does He call His Son Lord? It says the common people heard Him gladly. The leaders, not so much. Because again, He has thrown something out to them that they can't answer. Remember uh, a little ways back, <coughs> He asked them, they said, uh, what authority do you come and do these things? He said, let me ask you a question. John's authority, was it from God? Oh, if we say it was from God, then the people want to know why we didn't worship with Him, honor Him, obey Him, listen to Him, get baptized by Him, do what He said we needed to do. But if we say not, the people might get angry and attack us because they really like John. So they said, well, we can't answer. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm not going to answer you either. That's right. And so He asked them another question, and what do they have here? Well, we can't answer that question either. Jesus, again, what is He doing? Is He just trying to show how smart He is and to show that He has the answers and they're the right answers and they're always the right answers? No. What is He trying to do? He is trying to open their eyes to see the truth. He's not simply trying to embarrass them. He wants them to understand. He wants them to be saved. He wants them to recognize that He is indeed the Messiah. He wants them to honor God. And so that's why Jesus is doing these things, to try to get them to open their eyes and to understand. That leads us into the final portion of this chapter. Begin in verse 38, And He said unto them in His doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at the feasts which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many there uh, were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all of her living. Amen. And so as he's speaking to them, he again continues uh, he condemns them. Why? To try to get them to open their eyes to the truth. And so he says, listen, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations, that's greetings in the marketplace. Have you ever seen today these preachers that they go somewhere and you introduce yourself or they introduce themselves to you and they say, well, I'm pastor so-and-so or I'm reverend so-and-so. And there are situations where that's appropriate to say. I'm not saying it's wrong every time. I've done that in some situations. Uh, uh, and there are times when that is necessary. But I'm talking about people that are maybe not in a uh, a setting where they're trying to counsel with somebody, but just greeting someone and they have to make sure that they let people know that I'm Reverend so-and-so, or I'm Pastor so-and-so, or I'm Doctor so-and-so. Right. They love the greetings. They love to go uh, and hear these people would wear the fancy clothes. Everybody knew they were scribes. And they loved, oh, look, there's so-and-so, he's a scribe. Hey, oh, look, he said hey to me. What is that? Hypocrisy. And so he says, you need to beware of those things. And what else do they love? The chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feast. Now again, is there anything absolutely wrong with what I'm about to say? No. Because every church does it different. 
and I'm not saying they're wrong in doing this, but there are some churches that make sure that the pastor or all the ministers are seated in prominent places. A lot of churches, they are all seated up behind the pulpit. Uh, they're seated up there um, so that everybody sees them. And in a way, that's a good thing because people need to know who the leaders of the church are. And so that's important. But there are cases where these people are sitting up there. Why? Because that is just a place of pride. Look where I'm sitting. I used to sit out in the audience, but oh, I'm sitting up here now. I'm sitting in the important seats. Can I say there is no more important seat in the church than any other seat? Those seats that are up behind the pulpit are no more important than those pews or those chairs or those seats or the floor where the people come to hear the Word of God. Amen. Every seat is important. Every person is important in the kingdom of God. It is just different jobs that people have been given. Not everybody can be the pastor. Not everybody can be the elder. Not everybody can be a deacon or a teacher or this or that. But God has a job for everybody to do. And those jobs are equally important to that of the pastor. But people seem to put pastors on pedestals and sometimes pastors get caught up in that being put on a pedestal because they think that is the most important job and because the pastor is always the one that's up front and he is the one that's always seen. And so they think, oh, he's the most important person. And really, that is far from the truth. Right. Let's not ever forget that. It is easy to get big headed and we have to watch ourselves. And Jesus says they love these things and you should not love these things. But what should you love? The Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength and your neighbor as yourself. That's what you should love. And so they love the chief seats in the synagogue and the uppermost room at feast. They devour widows' houses. So sometimes you would have a widow and uh, they would go to a scribe or a Pharisee and they said, listen, you know, my husband's dead and, and I don't know anything about managing my house or this or that. I need help. And so the Pharisee would be, I'll be more than happy to take care of that. And unfortunately, what happened? Well, what happens a lot of today with a lot of these preachers we see on TV uh, that's all about money and things like that, these Pharisees would rob these women blind and make sure that they got everything once the women were dead. They would make sure that they would be dedicated to God if you would, but God wouldn't get it, they would get it. And they would use it and do things that's not right to do. And so that's what it's talking about there. Um, they devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. For a show, they make long prayers. Why? So people go, oh, look how great he is at praying. He must be so close to God. Mm. Oh, I wish I could pray like that. I wish I could be that close to God. And Jesus says here, actually, they're going to receive the greater damnation. Mm. Why? Because they know better. Right. They know better. <clears throat> and then he tells us that he's sitting against the treasury. And he's watching people cast money. And he sees that there are a lot of rich folks that are casting in a lot of money. But they're casting out the abundance of their wealth. They're not casting in till it hurts. Right. And then there comes this poor widow woman, throws in two mites. Uh, probably all that she had in the world. Her last two, today we would say pennies, yeah. if you will. But threw in all she had. And he calls his disciples and says, listen. That widow has cast in more than all the others. Have. Oh yeah, they cast in more money. Right. But she's casting in the last of her money. These two little pennies. And what is she doing doing that? She's saying, you know what? I am going to have to depend on God. Amen. God is going to have to make sure I am taken care of. 
And so she is cast in far more in faith than they did in abundance. And so again, what is he doing? Rebuking them, not so much for their wealth. God has made good Christian people wealthy. But it comes down to how we use that wealth. Do we use it to honor God and love our neighbor? Or do we use it to glorify ourselves and make ourselves look good? Right. And only make ourselves. Let's not say that we can't have nice things and buy nice things, but if all we're focused on is that, then we have a problem. Right. And then finally it says, For they did cast into their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So again, confirming that uh, she's cast those things in. Honoring God and saying, Lord, I depend on You to take care of my needs. That's right. Can I tell you something? I guarantee you God took care of her needs. Amen. Was it one of the Psalms or Proverbs? I'm sorry, I don't remember now, but uh, the writer said, I've never seen God's people go hungry. Those that love and trust God, it comes around some of them. They're not going to starve to death. They may not have much. They may be eating soup that's more or less hot water and some dry bread, but they're not going to starve. And we've talked before again, how many times have we gotten down to where how am I going to take care of this or that? Mm -hmm. And we said, I'll just leave it in God's hands and God works it out. Again, teaching His disciples a lesson. What is one of the main lessons He's been trying to teach them all along? You be the servant, not the master. Humble yourselves and take care of others. Teach others. Don't be like these that master themselves or act as masters over everyone, but you be the servant of all and you will be what greatest in the kingdom of heaven thank you so much for being here with us this evening again i hope you didn't pay too much attention to the scenery behind me but uh listen and i hope that you will go back and continue to study these things and uh, that will god will bless that time together let's close in prayer father we're again grateful thank you so much for this evening thank you for allowing us to gather together here lord and bless our time together. Father, touch us and help us to understand these things and even more, Lord. Go with us. Help us again to be lights in this dark world. And we ask it in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.